An interstellar spacecraft named Von Braun leaves Earth orbit for a planet some six and a half light years away. Are we ready to confront the technical challenges of a mission that will take decades to complete? To find out, a team of top scientists, engineers, and artists create a virtual mission to Darwin IV, fourth planet in a binary system called Darwin. Today, we search for planets like Earth through telescopes. The Darwin IV mission simulates the next giant step, the unmanned quest to find life beyond our solar system. The Von Braun is roughly the size of a nuclear attack submarine and travels at 37,000 miles per second, 20% the speed of light. The metal composite nose shield that protects the ship is cratered by collisions with space debris accumulated during the 42-year journey to Darwin IV. The planet orbits the larger sun of a binary solar system in a zone just close enough to its own star for comfort, a sweet spot astronomers call the Goldilocks zone. The Von Braun's first priority is to call home. A digital message will be sent through a laser beam, but the limits of time and space impose a roaming charge for long distance. Even at the speed of light, Von Braun's transmissions to Earth take six and a half years, making it impractical for engineers to correct problems. So Von Braun and its probes will have to think on their own. The first phase of the mission is to deploy the Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiter, or DRO. Images surge through the DRO's camera lens. Infrared, radar, and visible light pictures reveal an equatorial mountain range and vast plains swirling with weather systems. Darwin IV has no oceans, just a small blue sea. Von Braun's computers sift through thousands of destinations before selecting the one landing site with the most to offer. The Von Braun launches a probe about the size of a dump truck named Balboa, after the famous explorer. Balboa enters Darwin's airspace as our first ambassador to a pristine alien planet. The first contact between Earth and Darwin literally falls to pieces. But the planners of the Darwin mission have prepared for just such a scenario. The Von Braun vehicle carries two additional probes. Probe Leonardo da Vinci is nicknamed Leo. Leo is followed by a twin probe, the eyes of Newton, aka Ike. The probes enter the atmosphere just like the space shuttles do on Earth. The final approach is a lazy S pattern to burn off excess speed before landing. Temperatures on the surface, 70 degrees Fahrenheit.
Leo is first to land and emerge from his vehicle. Leo's bird-like head is crammed with sensors. Driven by protocols embedded in his software, Leo confirms that Ike's landing is on track and sends a status report to the Von Braun. The news that Leo and Ike have landed is beamed to Earth. Perhaps it's fitting that scientists who were babies when the Von Braun left Earth now announce the birth of interstellar space travel. Leo's first assignment is to recon a region studded by tall, mysterious, gourd-like structures. Before he can take them on, he's got to get himself together. Darwin IV's atmosphere is drenched in water vapor, a free source of hydrogen, which Leo converts to inflate a large bag on his back. It's covered with photosynthetic solar panels. The array turns a green hue as an algae-like material within the cells generates energy from Darwin IV's two suns. Leo's bird-like head contains two sensitive camera eyes. His arms are simulated plastic muscle, tipped with sensors and a manipulator that can pluck a petal off an alien daisy. Thrusters on pivots push him along at a top speed of 30 miles an hour. Leo senses movement in his side-scanning radar. and investigate the source of the movement. His artificial intelligence isn't programmed for it at this point. Leo's first priority is finding his yellow-tailed brother. While physically identical, Ike and Leo were created with complementary personalities. Ike is safety conscious. Leo is inquisitive and programmed to take risks. Their artificial IQs are roughly those of four-year-old children. Their missions can be redirected by the Von Braun supercomputers at any time. Assisting them are mini probes, like this spider. It's designed to explore places too tight or dangerous for Leo and Ike. The data they collect is transmitted to the Von Braun for analysis. Camera discs serve as high-speed scouts. <laughs> saucers can be retrieved and recharged. Radical changes in Darwin IV's weather could tear the probes to shreds. So Ike and Leo deploy an early warning system. Small weather balloons monitor the atmosphere. It's now time for the last diagnostic check. Should Ike or Leo confront intelligent life, they'll present a calling card in the form of a hologram. Number comprehension, images of our galaxy, solar system, the Earth, and the human species are offered as an interstellar handshake. Leo has sensed something again. Von Braun determines that Leo and Ike are fully prepared to explore the bizarre structures that surround them. 
Scientists will name them gourd trees. Fifteen stories high, they stand on a matrix of root-like stilts. Von Braun's computers determined the stilts could only support such a huge mass if the gourds were hollow or filled with some type of spongy material. But Leo and Ike are not programmed to immediately study objects like the gourd trees. Some astrobiologists predict the only alien life forms we may stumble upon are microorganisms, and the probes are designed to study them. Leo is programmed to search for them in the first puddle of water he finds. A microcosmos of single and multiple cell life forms fill his sensors. But Leo is about to discover that life on Darwin 4 comes in many sizes and many faces. This life form is roughly the size of a T-Rex. But instead of a roar, it directs a single wave of sonar at Leo and Ike. eyesight may be less evolved than large life on Earth. So using sonar could be a more accurate means of locating objects around it, like Leo and Ike. Splotches of bioluminescence cover the creature's back. Astrobiologists could call this creature the arrow tongue. The arrow tongue determines the probes pose no threat and turns its attentions elsewhere. The gyro sprinter is a two-legged vegetarian about twice the size of an African antelope. Arrow tongue reveals itself as an ambush predator, capable of great bursts of speed. As predator and prey hit speeds of 40 miles per hour, the probes are left in the dust. Ike launches a camera disc to follow the action. The arrow tongue commands the road like a semi-truck, but the gyro sprinter corners on a dime. Night falls on Darwin 4. Scattered bands of bioluminescence rake the surface like some kind of alien landscape lighting. Possibly it's a form of communication on Darwin 4. But Ike and Leo ignore the light show and push on towards their prime objective. Their first priority is to scour the landing site for Balboa, the lost probe, to confirm its fate. The Darwin mission now depends on just two intrepid probes with the intelligence of preschoolers. Images of the Balboa and of large life forms taken by Ike and Leo are evaluated by the Von Braun. 
its supercomputers now make important adjustments in the programming of the two probes. The probes are directed to split up. Leo will hunt for Darwin's larger creatures, while Ike explores ecosystems and life forms that resemble plants. As Leo's quest begins, he flies over a geothermal vent. Here, he'll top off his gas bag with some hydrogen from the mist. But even during a pit stop, a good probe keeps exploring. Life on Darwin IV never stops either. In the midst of this volcanic cauldron, Leo finds microorganisms that resemble some found in hot springs on Earth. Leo looks for big game. His twin probe, Ike, explores a small, isolated forest. The floor is covered with stickball plants, part sponge, part virus. Giant molds called Darwin tomatoes rise from the dense soil. Then Ike's sensors suddenly direct him skyward. Called trunk suckers, they cling to these plaque bark trees, sucking nourishment from the nutrient rich layers just beneath the tough outer shingles. It's here that the mission reaches another milestone. After seeing life everywhere, Ike gets his first glimpse of death on Darwin IV. But death from what? For the past three days, the Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiter has tracked a large object moving rapidly across the surface. Leo has been ordered to investigate what mission scientists call an object of interest. As it turns out, the object of interest is not an object at all. It's a bunch of them. Leo locks onto a herd of creatures called unts. gets to the herd, the more his attention turns from motion to sound. Unts have nostrils and lungs, but they also inflate secondary air sacs on both sides of their bodies. Unts are named after the sound they make when they exhale through their dorsal vents.
Like buffaloes on Earth, the unts are competitive, possibly fighting for domination of the herd. Something spooks the herd. Leo senses movement nearby, but can't get a fix. His sensors are simultaneously scanning in all directions, looking for the strongest signal. The newest input comes through Leo's microphones. A pair of bladder horns compete. Bioluminescent antlers are displayed to scare off opponents. from this jewel might have spooked the unts. Leo interprets the back and forth bellowing as a form of communication. Perhaps this alien grump is smarter than it looks. Leo deploys the Earth communication screen. Like a greeting card, it's the best hello we can offer. But if the bladderhorn is saying anything, it's probably telling Leo to get lost. cuts and runs as Leo's sensors detect another disturbance. For the next 24 hours, the Von Braun makes several attempts to communicate with Leo, but gets no reply. A grim dispatch rides a laser beam to Earth. Probe Da Vinci has gone offline. Cause unknown. Unless he resumes transmitting again, Leo is virtually an invisible dot on a vast alien landscape. Leo's twin probe, Ike, soldiers on. He finds another pocket forest, the living remains of woodlands that thrived until Darwin's oceans evaporated and the climate changed. As Ike begins to scan the trees, his sensors pick up something new, lurking on a high branch of a plaquebark tree. Scientists will call it the dagger wrist for good reason. When Ike launches a camera disc, the dagger risk is not interested in posing. The dagger wrist's forelimbs sink so deep, the nutrient rich sap bleeds to the surface. Ike's not programmed to approach something this aggressive. That was Leo's job. Mm. 
The study of plant life is Ike's mission, until von Braun orders otherwise. Finding water is statistically the most efficient method of finding vegetation. Ike scans a carpet of moss at the edge of a deep water marsh. But what lies beyond it is even more intriguing. Ike surveys three odd mounds covered with saplings. But appearances are deceiving on Darwin IV. Rising five stories into the air is a massive paradox. The Grove Back. Grove backs bury themselves alive for long periods of time. They're not hibernating, they're feeding. Grove backs absorb nutrients from the soil through the skin of their underbodies. When the ground's depleted, they move on in search of new feeding areas. Groves of trees sprout from these immense creatures. The grove back provides them water from its spongy tissue. The trees inject sugars into the grove back. Just enough juice to jumpstart these titanic walkabouts on Darwin IV. As von Braun tries to get a fix on Leo, his twin probe, Ike, moves deeper into the foothills of Darwin IV. Like groves of pine on Earth, the pocket forests of Darwin IV are covered with colonies of passive organisms that feed on the moist, spongy floor. As Ike continues to explore, the Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiter detects a sudden atmospheric disturbance. While Ike's sensors clock the wind at only 30 miles per hour, the super-dense atmosphere gives it the kinetic punch of a young hurricane. Ike has no choice but to head for the ceiling to get out of the storm. Ike fires a salvo of weather balloons to sample the currents of the unexplored upper atmosphere. Unlike the Earth, where storms are fed by great oceans, Darwin IV's airspace is a shifting maze of thermals rising from hotspots created by the two suns. The power of passing storms present a new and potentially lethal threat to the mission. Ike is little more than a fragile sack of hydrogen on a planet where even the weather seems predatory. But for now, it's back to the business of discovery. Ike's motion sensors pick up activity within the grove. Not on the ground, but in the air. The link between a deadly hunter, its prey, and the plaque bark tree suddenly unfolds. The dark king of the pocket forest fills in the missing pieces of a predatory puzzle.
trunk suckers feed on the sap from gashes made by climbing dagger rusts. Ike's data confirms that dagger wrists extract the pre-digested material from the corpses of their prey. A gruesome but energy-efficient survival strategy on Darwin 4. The weather on Darwin 4 is puzzling. 130 days have passed since Ike began his survey, and never once has it rained. As far as Ike's sensors can determine, Darwin's surface waters flow from underground aquifers and springs. That might explain why forests can only exist in small pockets. Ike takes his survey to a high meadow where his side-scanning radar detects some new blips. A sonar ping throws a herd of littoral lopes into a pattern. Like the arrow tongue, these aerial killers hunt with sonar. No creature on Darwin 4 is safe from the lance of the flying skewer. The lance itself is hollow and as strong as titanium. Running through its center is a razor-spiked tongue that bores through the toughest hide. Helpless prey are killed and drained of fluids. Scavengers, called jet darters, feed on the rest. On Darwin 4, the mission encounters giant life forms and supersized animal organisms, all supported by a dense, humid atmosphere and a lower gravity than on Earth. Ruling the skies are falcon like predators called skewers. Aerial life forms that travel and hunt in pairs. Skewers maneuver by changing the shape of their 50-foot wingspans. But it's not their wings that actually propel them. Skewers create methane gas internally and combust it in four jet-like pods. defend themselves by scattering in all directions. Skewers are forced to choose only one target. Darwin's aerial predator is literally knocked from the sky. But by what? High above the foothills of Darwin's equatorial mountain chain, Ike's sensors detect unusual bursts of energy. A swarm of scavengers called jet darters stray into a kill zone. What looks like a colony of oversized mushrooms is a deadly maze. Ike's programmed to gather more data to learn how it works. The answer must lie within the organisms themselves. 
but Ike can't risk frying his circuit boards. A mini probe is the only expendable option. The crawler will look for the power source from below. Acting like a light switch, the crawler has closed a fatal gap between two electric charges. Like sensors pick up a familiar signature. Just walking on Darwin IV is a hazardous undertaking. Even a five-story grove back must watch its step. A colony of beach quills launch an assault on a careless growth back. The quills penetrate deep into the creature's hide and deliver a fatal dose of neurotoxins. Beach quills consume the grove back alive. Far from the killing field, another struggle continues in a remote corner of Darwin IV. Leo has no fix on his location. To find his position, he must launch a camera disc to clue in to his surroundings. <laughs> Leo's last transmission allows Von Braun's supercomputers to plot his location. Ike is roughly 200 miles away from Leo as he continues his survey of the foothills. Badlands encrusted with ancient lava fields are covered with lichens and low vegetation. Ike's sensors now lock on to higher life forms. Like alien ghosts, they seem to come from everywhere. But these nimble creatures all follow the same scent. On Earth, we have wolves. On Darwin IV, they're called prongheads. Gyro sprinters are fast and invasive creatures. But prongheads know how to run interception. Like pack predators on Earth, not every hunt ends in success. But the discovery of cooperative hunting is a major breakthrough. The inhabitants of Darwin IV are more evolved than anticipated. Artificial intelligence computers on the Von Braun have decided to do something about Leo. As a result, the protocols that control Ike's behavior are reprioritized.
Ike is ordered to break off his survey immediately. He's now instructed to assume greater risks. His mission now is to find Leo. The journey will take him across a vast, unexplored region of Darwin IV. Based on data from the reconnaissance orbiter, Darwin's oceans evaporated millions of years ago, transforming the air into a dense, oxygen-rich blanket. When the oceans vanished, they left behind a bad land of twisted spires. Over the eons, some have grown a mile high. The spires are the accumulated remains of billions of tons of ocean salts and minerals. Ike identifies a new object of interest, like nothing yet seen on Darwin IV. The curved formations don't mesh with the environment. Perhaps they were made by some creature yet to be discovered. While Darwin lost its oceans, it still maintains a sea roughly the size of Texas. But what looked like water from space doesn't hold up under closer examination. The water's edge looks like a thick sheet of gelatin surrounded by great spires of salt. I can't penetrate the surface. It's like a waterbed teeming with life. What looks like a sea is actually a vast colony, a matrix of symbiotic life forms. They evolved as the oceans evaporated, trapping seawater within their transparent membranes. The Von Braun has calculated that crossing the amoebic sea is the quickest way to reach the site of Leo's last transmission. But halfway there, Ike spots a radical change in the surface texture. suddenly behaves like a gigantic predator that preys on low-flying game. The Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiter issues a sudden storm alert. A wall of debris is closing in at high speed. Ike's one chance to survive may already be out of reach. Ike 
could have run from the storm by rising above it. But his new directive is to assume greater risk in the search for Leo. Crossing the amoebic sea is the shortest path. Ike's sensors detect a huge disturbance. But it's not the storm. The Strider is seven stories tall. Now Ike detects more movement. Flyers seem to orbit the Strider, attracted to an energy source just beneath its mouthless head. The Striders are not just walking on the surface, they're taking chunks of it along with them. The storm ends as suddenly as it began. The Striders are heading the same direction Ike must take to reach Leo. So Ike will tag along and gather data on the alien giants. Astrobiologists could find that the Striders eat from mouths at the bottom of their giant feet. Trudging back and forth across the sea on a movable feast. Something's disturbed the Striders, but quickly vanishes from Ike's sensors. The Flyers are nymph-like young of the Sea Striders. have a relationship to the sea as well. The far shore is finally in sight. Here, the peaceful giants of Darwin IV make a U-turn. Based on Leo's transmissions to the Von Braun, Ike will follow his trail like a robotic bloodhound. Within hours, Ike nears one of Leo's last reported locations. The Unth herd hasn't strayed far from where Leo first encountered them. Mm. 
An adult makes ruts in the ground. Perhaps the patterns found by the spires were created by a herd like this one. Ike spots a metallic glint that could only come from Leo. It's not the camera disc that stumps Ike's computer. It's what lays around it. Ike is unable to determine if something actually built this site. Ike detects motion as he heads for Leo's final transmission point. The bladder horn still defends the same piece of turf. But Leo's nowhere in sight. No place to run and no time to hide from Darwin's deadliest predator. The probe is not equipped to evade predators like the skewer. But that's not a problem now. Ike's sensors pick up a new life form. And he follows the signal. The skewer has disappeared. The trail ends at the base of a steep mountain face. Or does it? Whatever killed the skewer has managed to lift all 50 feet of it up a sheer cliff. Ike senses no movement, no transmissions coming from his twin probe, Leo. Ike senses movement all around him. Suddenly, movement is detected from Leo's direction. This 
alien could have easily destroyed the probe. Instead, it waits for Ike to make the next move. When Ike projects numeric symbols, the alien seems ready to respond. Part one is a test to determine if this alien creature can conceptualize and is therefore intelligent. Light flashes three symbols. The alien responds correctly with four flashes. This response triggers Ike to deliver the rest of the message. creature closes in, Ike launches a camera disc to assess the threat. 